Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Gail Robos. I am a professor of medicine and director of the leukemia program at Weill Cornell Medicine in the New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. It's my pleasure to take a couple of minutes today to discuss the importance of pathological classification systems in the treatment and diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia. So talking about classification systems in AML is complicated because there is currently more than one available. And not only that, we have to discuss not only pathological classification, i.e. what the pathologists are using to tell us and tell the patients what they have, but also risk stratification systems, which are used to try to prognosticate what exactly the patient's biology of disease is going to predict with respect to their treatment outcomes. So what does all of this mean? Well, back in the day in the 1970s or so with the FAB classification, we knew that AML was diagnosed based on a, uh, an assessment of greater than or equal to 30% blasts in a bone marrow aspirate. And then over the years, as the WHO classification evolved, what we saw was first in the late 90s, a decrease in the requirement for BLAST to 20%. So that was actually a big deal. All of a sudden, AML went from 30% to 20% BLASTs. And then over the ensuing 20 years, the um, addition of cytogenetic and then molecular genetic abnormalities became incorporated into the WHO. So we were now talking about 20% blast, not 30, and also different cytogenetic and evolving molecular genetics that were required for pathological uh, classification of the disease. To make things extra complicated, ironically, the international consensus classification, uh, meaning to be a consensus, created lack of consensus rather than consensus. So in 2022, we had a new incarnation of the WHO as well as the ICC 2022. And while both of these systems were um, designed and put together by teams, large teams actually of experts trying to incorporate the evolving biology and knowledge of the um, mechanisms and biological landscape of AML into these new classifications, what happened was that some differences emerged. And these differences are challenging both for patients and clinicians. Now, on the one hand, there really only is probably, a, I think this was studied to be about a 15% or so divergence between the classification systems. But the problem is that these differences sometimes cause uh, consternation um, in clinic because first of all, the ICC has a category that includes something called MDS slash AML. So from zero to 19% blasts could be MDS slash AML, and then more than 20% is AML. This is really hard for patients to understand. They really don't get it why we can't figure out whether they have MDS or AML. Most of the time, the patients jump quickly onto the internet and these diseases read very, very differently. And they really don't understand how there can be a line in the sand that was first 30% and then 20% and now 19% is MDS slash AML, but 21% is AML. These things are very hard. And yet the whole point of the creation of this category was to allow patients who are in an in-between zone, for example, high blast counts of 17, 18, 19%, which clinicians and really know are biologically indistinct from patients who are hovering at just over 20%. These patients may benefit from um, uh, participation in clinical trials that could otherwise have excluded them. In other words, somebody with 17% blast who's categorized as MDS would be excluded from an AML trial. Similarly, with the advent of additional therapies, the question becomes whether patients with those higher blast count ranges who are now classified by ICC as MDS slash AML, 
might benefit from so-called AML-directed therapy. And we are actively awaiting, for example, a large clinical trial called the Verona trial, in which the um, commonly used standard induction for older patients with AML, a combination of azacitidine and venetoclax, is now given to MDS patients. And we're waiting to see whether the survival benefit in those patients will mirror the significant survival benefit versus azacitidine alone that was seen in AML patients receiving the combination. So basically, ICC and WHO distinguish now MDS slash AML versus AML. That's a major thing for um, doctors and patients to consider. But in addition to that, there are a couple of more significant changes. For example, if you have an NPM1 mutation by the ICC, you're um, uh, called AML if you have more than 10% blasts, but in the WHO, NPM1 mutational abnormality now gives you a diagnosis of um, AML irrespective of the blast count. So this is confusing too, because there are patients who might have four or six or 9% blasts and an NPM1 mutation where patients and doctors are really struggling as to whether they want to embark on a full chemotherapy-based AML induction or whether they should be doing something quote unquote easier than that. The data are based on patients with NPM1 mutations um, and lower blast counts behaving in an aggressive manner that's more consistent biologically with AML. And yet in clinic, clinicians will say all the time that they have encountered patients with NPM1 mutations who actually don't necessarily behave in such an aggressive indolent, uh, an aggressive manner and for whom lesser or less intensive therapies might be appropriate. So this is, this is complicated and doctors will debate often whether or not the pathological um, classification of an NPM1 patient with 7% blasts as AML means that they would go ahead with just as intensive an, indu an induction as if that same patient had 30% blast. It's a controversial area at the moment. Similarly, TP53 mutations fell out as a separate category based on their poor prognosis. Um, uh, TP53 is called out as a separate diagnostic uh, category in the ICC, but not in the WHO. And even rare abnormalities, for example, CBP um, alpha mutations are greater than 10% blasts AML in the ICC, more than 20% in the WHO. And then there are a host of changes related to AML uh, with myelodysplasia related changes. So in the ICC, it's again, zero to 19% that MDS slash AML category it's more than 20% in uh, WHO, but even there, there are separate uh, distinctions. For example, RUNCS1 is not considered diagnostically defining in the WHO. These types of subtle abnormalities um, are actually resulting in a lot of pathologists and a lot of academic institutions, as well as some commercial labs, reporting both the ICC and the WHO classifications for individual patients. And this can be quite a challenge because the results are sometimes the same, but sometimes the subtle differences that I've gone over will result in will sort of pathological dilemmas of what to actually call this. And the clinicians are left to explain to the patient exactly how they are seeing the disease. Now, this leads me to my next point, which is that regardless of how you're classifying the disease, well, what are you going to do about it? And I think here we move into um, prognostic risk stratifications, for example, the ELN 2022, the European Leukemia Net 2022, which combines cytogenetics and molecular genetic um, information to give favorable, intermediate, and adverse categories. Now here, this is quite important because the ELN 2022 was based on what happened to patients who were treated with intensive chemotherapy. And a lot of those patients actually got transplanted as well. So the designation of favorable intermediate and adverse in that risk system based on intensive chemotherapy has recently been shown not to be applicable, for example, in patients who get treated with non-intensive combinations. 
So what does all of this say? Well, the majority of AML patients are older. The median age is 67 years. Many of those patients are getting treated now with a combination of hypomethylating agents and venetoclax. And actually, you're going to see publications soon, based on some of the preliminary data that have been presented at meetings, that there will be new classifications for those patients to correctly stratify them by outcomes. You can't use the ELN 2022 to risk stratify correctly a patient who's gotten um, a hypomethylating agent and venetoclax. All of this means that it's not the outcomes of patients with AML are not hard baked into the biology. It depends a lot on what the treatment is that's available. For example, a FLT3 mutation used to be absolutely in an adverse risk category until we now have good quality FLT3 inhibitors. And rapidly the patients started doing better and that particular abnormality got moved into an intermediate risk. So I think it's very important for clinicians and for patients to sit together and look at the different classifications. What is the combination of cytogenetic, molecular, genetic, and morphologic data according to these different pathologic classifications that we have, the ICC and the WHO? Then have a look at what the patient is actually doing clinically. How sick are they? How are they doing overall? And try to see, depending on which treatment is going to be selected, how are they predicted to do? So it's actually a synthesis of a lot of information. And I would end by saying that most importantly, as we're looking at all of these classifications and all of these data, to not forget to look at the actual patient, because I certainly have many, many examples where taking a look at the patient actually tells me a lot more about the disease behavior than necessarily just being kind of uh, stuck with the um, with what's in the box at the bottom of the pathology report. Um, that said, I do think it's important to discuss with the pathologist if you're not clear why a difference was called at the end of the report between the ICC and the WHO to go over those data to make sure that it's clear to both the treating physician and to, to the patient how the diagnosis was made, and then to try to fit it into the uh, treatment landscape that we have available to ultimately pick the best option. Thank you for listening and look forward to our next session on um, topics related to acute myeloid leukemia.